lifted the boot lid just as my mother decided to drive away, which would have been fine, apart from the fact that the two policemen in the car behind no. thought that we were body snatchers. So <laughs> head after my mother and arrested my mother and questioned my father for distress. So anyway, that's not the story I'm going to tell. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast episode number 25, which according to my ropey maths is a quarter of a way to a century. What amazing times these are. Um, this week, we better start with some F1 because there was a race at the weekend. We haven't had F1 at the top of the agenda for a while. You might find it boring, but it is the biggest motorsport in our sphere and we have to discuss it. Manish, talk me through the shambles of track limits and then we'll talk about other stuff. Okay, so the Austrian Grand Prix. Um, we all watched a race that we thought was a race. Shortly after the race, a bunch of protests happened. And I have no idea who protested what or how or when, but it turns out nor did the drivers. They were just driving on their merry way. And it turns out that 1,200 track limits were exceeded. So what we thought happened didn't really happen. Orders were changed. And um, actually, Chris Cooper is going to be the total expert on this because I've been wondering, and there's a good old maxim, isn't there, in Formula One, why can't you treat the white lines as if they're walls in Monaco? And the answer that, to that has got to be because these guys are motor racing drivers. Yeah, there isn't actually a wall there. Exactly. If you don't put a wall there, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go over it and see if they can get away with it. But I think, I think it's just got to a point of absurdity with this Grand Prix because the whole point of track limits. And I remember once I um, actually sat with the marshal at Silverstone. I can't even remember which corner we were at. We were at a corner and, you know, it was his job to log track limits. And yeah. when, you know, when all four wheels were over the line, he made a little tick and he called it in. And the whole idea was you did this three times and you got a penalty. And we take this stuff seriously because you are supposed to, in theory, be racing on a circuit. And I think where this was really, really, and where this race was so odd was that normally you get a warning. So what you can then do is modify your behavior. But I think, was it Ocon, Chris, that, um, you know, basically got to the end of the race, thought he'd done a good job, found himself demoted, and sort of said, well, why didn't you just tell me that I'd exceeded track yeah. limits? And maybe I could have modified my driving. And I think that's where this race it was really, really frustrating. And it's nuts, isn't it, that we're actually not talking about a fantastic race in Austria and Max dominating in that fantastic bit of theatre at the end where he sets fastest lap because he's just so confident now. He could. Yeah, because we're, but, but we're talking about track limits. And I think Chris actually explained really, really well um, why these circuits no longer have sausages or gravel traps. And over to you, Chris. So, uh, I mean, it's good, that's a good summary. Um, and that kind of tells most of the story of the frustration that everybody felt and the, you know, the farcical nature of it, or sort of WTF. So I had to do a bit of checking, um, important research work on YouTube this afternoon, not a wormhole at all. Um, and 20 years ago, this wasn't a problem. People didn't talk about track limits 20 years ago. Why? Because there was a white line some places would be curbed, a little bit of grass and gravel. The curbs were sort of curb-ish, curby, curbish. They weren't flat with red and white paint on them. Why did that change? Well, it changed for a number of reasons. Some of you might have seen that extraordinary, horrific looking crash that Simon Pagano had in mid-Ohio yeah. in IndyCar at the weekend, where he just lost, I think he lost it and get hit, lost it. It's a glorious track. Those US tracks are just unbelievably fantastic. Got it sideways, hit a bit of something coming off, car got a little bit like that, hit the gravel and just tumbled and tumbled and tumbled like that. That was regarded as not desirable. So tarmac runoff started, and in bizarrely, it seems a bit odd, but in the wet, when it rains a lot, gravel beds can sort of compact and they sort of don't, so they kind of just skidding across them. So tarmac runoff started to replace gravel traps. Um, but there was still the last line of defense, which was curbs, sausage curbs in particular. Um, and I, many of us will remember an extraordinary, horrific looking accident at Monza 
2019 in Formula 3, a guy called Alex Peroni, not Pironi, Peroni. Um, some bright spot. I mean, these are all well-intentioned ideas. We've not arrived here because somebody had bad faith and bad intentions. Uh, Parabolica, Monkey and you know, I have raced there. That sort of extraordinary, historic, wonderful corner at the sort of the end of the back straight at Monza, which opens and opens and opens and opens. It's, it is perfectly parabolic. Um, but single seaters were getting because the curves got flatter and there's tarmac runoff because of people don't like rolling. Um, sausage going put in. This Porsche got slightly wide, hit one of these sausage curves and launched to the moon. Car took off, tumbled and twisted through the air, hit the top of the tyre barrier, then tumbled into the catch fencing. He had a halo. If he hadn't had a halo, that would have been it. So sausage curves are bad. So we ended up with and bike racing. So Austria is a good example. MotoGP in Austria is at uh, the A1 ring. Salzburg ring, as it probably was probably once originally before in its old format years ago. And circuit owners pay lots of money now to run these races and they need more revenue. Bike racing. Bikes don't mix much with gravel and certainly not with sausage curves. So you end up with this lots of runoff and lots of flat curves. That is not what anybody had in mind. So I said, okay, well, there's always been a rule. If you look in the rules, it's always said the track is, is delineated by the white line. Problem then became, how do you track it? And this has been this trade-off between, well, why bother tracking it? If, as long as they're somewhere near the track. But then circuit owners started saying, well, hang on, it's costing us a lot. To, we're having to sort of do more stuff and it's expensive. And drivers said, well, hang on, it's, it's cheating. So we ended up with this standoff, which Austria, I think, helpfully brought to a head, which was there's an incompatibility. This is an inconvenient truth. There's some well-intentioned actions and desires to make racing safer the circuits more accessible to other forms of the sport but the lack of arrangements be they human or technology or otherwise and say did you go over the edge of the track has led us to this 1200 infractions and there were probably more some drivers did you know for george and i think uh joe guanzu i think those the two drivers didn't have any reported infractions so they might have behaved a bit better, but yeah, it's, and in Motorsport UK, we've had this debate in the sport in the UK and in the UK now, I think what we want to do is to say, there are probably some technology solutions. Are there automated camera systems, sensors in the road? The MSV circuits have curb sensors, but if it was just down to me, if I really was in charge of everything, I would say we've got to get back to gravel traps, bit of grass, you know, a, a reasonable curb, a bit of grass, and then gravel. Um, and then we won't worry about drivers thinking, I can go faster by going wider. But Chris, I, one, what, one, one point, though. I mean, I think <clears throat> there is a little bit of, you know, the naive monkey in me asks, well, why don't they just modify it for, uh, for Formula One and then get rid of the curbs? And what you realise is these circuit owners are paying such a lot of money to host a Formula One race that, you know, prob probably that becomes uneconomic. I mean, may maybe what Formula One needs to do to them is to say, look, it matters to us to have the competition decided on track. Yeah. So tell us what it's going to cost to put these sausages in and gravel travel and tell us what it costs to remove yeah. those and let's come to an arrangement. Yeah, that's one option you know, is... There, there are some circuits which already have experimented with bolt in and bolt out. Exactly, yeah. They've done that with sausage curbs. Here we go. So I, I, a long time ago, much cleverer people than me uh, said that I wasn't allowed to sit in meetings and criticise unless I offered some sort of solutions or tried to be positive. Hmm. So given that we love, many of us love other sports, in fact, there was a sporting event going on on Sunday that meant that I didn't watch the Grand Prix live. Um, <laughs> and that sport has lots of, um, it has lots of technology available to see whether there have been um you know type of dismissals it's cricket we're talking about here um and we can there's a lot of there's a technology suite they can rely on to help the umpires decide and don't forget there are umpires in in motorsport they're called marshals and they are judges of fact judges of fact exist in yeah. most sports they exist in tennis as well another sport that has a significant amount of technology it can rely on is it beyond the realms of possibility that we could have a situation that means that if your car's wheel goes beyond a certain point of the white line the power gets cut for a lap 
You know when you go, you know when you go karting in France and you're three mates and you're a bit pissed. You Neil yeah. would have done this at the morning. You're a bit naughty. Mm-hmm. The old the old patron can press a button, a naughty button, and you all suddenly start oh, doing yeah. two miles an hour. And he stands there and he remonstrates and he says, "If you don't do that, you can't have your raclette and you can fuck off." Now I don't see. We always talk, we laugh about the Bernie button, but I cannot believe that in this day and age, in 2023, there isn't technology that couldn't monitor every F1 track and say, well, look, if you want to keep going over that line, that's fine. But the next lap, you're going to do 70 miles an hour and, and you're, the guy you were dicing with is going to come past you going, <laughs> like we do in karting when you slow down. Um, and you think that will alter behaviour immediately? But I, I just don't, I don't understand how motorsport's got itself in such a fix. I, I, hear, I hear Chris talking about this which is ironic given that on for many years his nickname was curbs uh in our in our motorsport groups but hearing, him, hearing him opine on track limits is amazing when uh, curbs, curbs d- is um is d- <laughs> with, with drs when it's turned off for the first three laps is it lit can, can a driver try and press the button in their car to engage drs they yes, can. he can, well, and it won't fine. work. Oh, they just don't. Yeah. Okay, fine. Maybe, that, maybe that's what they do, Chris. You're right. That, yeah. that really simple way. You lose your DRS the next lap. You just lose I, it. I just, I just think there's enough technology out there. Yeah. I, you see, the the old bastard in me that you know walks around being grumpy just thinks, well, why don't they just do what they do at motorway when there's a motorway, you know, a motorway roadworks? Just bring out a load of concrete blocks like they do for street circuits in the US. Just plonk them down on the white line and say, well, you can go over the white line if you want, but there's concrete block there. But I think if there was an accident that happened yeah. at the corner before and someone got hurt we that's not an acceptable solution in 2023 and you know, i don't want to go to a race and see people get hurt I, that's ghoulish i'm not interested yeah. in it so but but i just don't believe they can't find a solution but chris is quite right this the, the problem here arises from the fact that we now we now expect motorsport venues to be to be universally usable across all forms of the sport yeah. and they just aren't they have very different demands. Each sport deserves the respect of the venue, and at the moment, if you if you offer a one you know a one stop solution, it's not really working. I don't see why bike riders should put themselves at risk because Formula One's bigger. I don't see why you know touring car drivers shouldn't be able to put on an amazing spectacle when they're four abreast bashing into each other. I think we want to see it all, and and, and it is a shame. And, and but the most important thing has to be safety it, it has to be safety but it was what what sort of advantage at the red bull ring could have you actually had if you maximized all of the track versus someone who keeps inside the white line uh, that's a good question that's a very good it question must, it must be Probably very fra- it Louis, must be very fra- fra- yeah, yeah so it'll be it'll be the difference between maybe lewis and george actually yeah. they were back back and they got switched around. But, it, but, but literally, surely, if, you did it, if, if, is... if, if you did it everywhere with no track limits, yeah. because there will become a point where you know as a driver, there's no point going a little bit further there because actually it's going to slow my lap down. Yeah, but, and... but, it, but, but also it, it, what the, the vagary here, and this is what caused the problem on the day, is that the judge of fact is human. So yeah. it's, it's the marshals that are noting down each time. And if, if three cars come through... You're already going to spot the first one. You're not going to spot the one behind the one behind that. So it's completely open to the nuances of human observation, at which point it's so flawed. And I I bet you that it was Aston Martin. This is Aston Martin. Aston Martin. Yeah. And that, so the team quite rightly, I think they probably thought, well, we've been we've been triggered nine times on that corner and we saw loads of other people go over. Totally understandable why yeah. they would then complain. And what you would have had was a load of Austrian notepads going, yeah, ich, ich sehe ein naughty boy. That was, that's, that's exactly what it. they sounded like. I mean, did yeah. you know last week that you said you could speak German? <laughs> yeah, ambition. <laughs> ambition, mine beautiful mannish. Right. Ich bin ein naughty <laughs> boy. I want, I, want, I want to ask one other question, and this is, this is not, this is actually out of admiration. I cannot believe how far ahead Max is of everyone else. He's got the best car, but be in no doubt, every time he gets in it, he extracts 101% from that car, and he is just on a different level. Why is it so joyless, though? Why is it, you know, if I was him, I think it is. So, he's so complete. Why is he not sort of taking the piss and giving it the... If I was him, I'd now be taking the piss out of every F1 driver's celebration. I'd have a combination of the Schumacher leap, the Vettel finger, and I'd probably start crying about 
the environment like Lewis does. You know, I, I try to combine all of that. Yeah. And, I, and I, I found it good to see how close the Ferrari and Perez were racing together and seeing um, Max just go off in the distance in yeah. effectively yeah. the same car. You know, the edge is him, but, not but the I car. Just, why, why, I just, I definitely just seem to enjoy it. Neil, you've got to have a theory on why he seems so joyless. <clears throat> I think he is, that is him being joyful. You imagine him what he's like for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> waiting for the next race. No, honestly, that that you know, he is a he's a human computer, right? He's that he is getting you're seeing the most amount of emotion from Max when he's on the TV. That's at his peak of character. Oh, do you That's think just, it's something to do with a lack of competition? I mean, is he just sitting here going, This is just joyless? No, no, the, no, the, on, this is the paradox of Max, because actually he doesn't like competition. If he goes wheel to wheel, more often than not. It'll be a spat, or he'll he'll get angry, or whatever. how often does he go? Yeah, that was a really good fight. Uh, not that often. Only That's if he wins. I mean, exactly. Also, he he is to, such a racing driver. It's on his terms. That's the essence of any racing driver. And you know, anybody who's driven, you know, monkey. You and I are really, really fortunate to have done all the racing we've done and to have had the, the experiences we've had. And yes, you could absolutely say that driving around the Nürburgring or Silverstone in a really nice car when you're you, you're totally incompetent and the car's working and it feels great. But after a while, I think, okay, what next? It's the racing. It's the gladiatorial, that nature of, you know, racing didn't come naturally to me. I was never a very confident or alpha male character. Racing changed my life. You, you, you bloody got there quite quickly, right? I saw you stuff it up the inside way too many times. <laughs> it changed my life. It gave me a platform. It gave me a stage to express myself. And I, mm. I realised how much I enjoyed that gladiatorial. Because in, you know, I wasn't naturally anything i wasn't physically or emotionally and you were that you were the you the precursor to ocon everyone says all the commentators say how lovely ocon is but you put him in a car he's an absolute psychopath yeah and i was i was and i was people walking around the car park no. shaking people's hands sounded like something from ed wardian novel and then when he gets in the car he's a he's a knife wielding psychopath so i think but this is the point with max so i think i asked because i talked about this with with finn and cam my boys and cam's cam's observation interesting he said he said, Dad, be careful about this one, because otherwise people just assume that, you know, you hate Max because and, yeah. and we don't. No, 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 don't, don't at all. Don't. No, we don't. Admire it. Yeah. Admire um, it. And Finn's view was interesting. He said, maybe just doesn't like the limelight, the flashiness. He just, maybe he'd just be as happy banging doors and winning. If touring cars was the ultimate, that's what he yeah. did. We all know he loves esports when he's not. Yeah. He's not racing or testing. He's on his simulator, not just playing with a simulator. He's in esports teams. There's a Max esports team. They did Daytona 24. He did. A, he's done 24 hour esport races. He loves the act and the feeling of driving and, and racing. We can't get it on circuit. Get it. So I think um, if you saw, it must be. You know how much satisfaction is he going to get from? Do you know what? And I'm going to win this one. He clearly likes winning. He will enjoy being world champion. Yeah. My hope is this is a short term blip, not just for him, but for the sport where, you know, maybe this, this, maybe this weekend at Silverstone, Mercedes bring a new set of updates. Who knows? Um, but if we were talking, if this was Kimmy, we were talking about, we were yeah. talking about it in a different way. I think, you know, Kimmy know. made an art form of, well, you know, Wow. He did, and he only won one championship. So actually, Max is doing it the right way, isn't he? Yeah. I think but he, he I, had humour, didn't he? He, oh, did. he was, he was clever. dry. I was going to say dry, but I didn't mean that kind of dry. Uh, he was, he was, he was clever. Right. I let's let's move on because I I feel we've we've slightly we've we don't want to come across as old men too much. We're not that grumpy, and we do think Max is sensational. I think we just find him a bit perplexing at times. That's it all. is perplexing. I agree with that. Yeah. It's a very it's a very um, interesting conundrum. I would um, let's move on to one that was posed. This was posed by um, by a uh, chaplain of this particular parish, uh, Neil Clifford, who said, "What's the most complicated breakdown you've had?" This is perhaps the most loaded question ever suggested on the Collecting Addicts podcast, and I feel that Neil might have something he needs to get off his chest. Neil, tell us about it. 
I think I, I think I suggested this whilst I was on the back of an AA trailer <laughs> last Friday with a with a fucking pothole puncher in London making my way home. It took me seven hours. I did offer to come and get you. You did, darling. You did. But I was I was at this point, um, and I tell it I tell a very sort of cheeky story on this. You ring the AA. You get through after tw- twenty minutes. You're like, "Oh bollocks, it's going to be fine." And then they they say, "Oh, just bear with him, Mister Clifford." Oh, your car seems to be sawn. You don't have any tax. So I'm like, "Oh, I'm, that's that's just, that's ridiculous." I must have done it this morning. I'm on the WhatsApp with my PA saying, "Fucking, can you tax this car really quickly?" And then and then of course she says, "No, now you've registered the call." You cannot tax the car, which, of course, um, it was taxed. It was their mistake, of course. I'm not saying it was untaxed. That, that would be clearly illegal. But yeah. anyway, they then offer to, yes, we can come and get you, sir. In fact, it would be quicker because that doesn't mean we have to send out the man who then says, yes, you've got a puncher. We've got to get a trailer. We'll send you a trailer directly. So for 240 quid last Friday, I was on the back of a trailer. But that is not my breakdown. My breakdown is the two hundred. I've got many. Quid. I, well, yeah, no, it was a bloody relief, frankly, because oh. how the hell am I going to get home from Highgate um, anyway? And in the traffic, and I, I could do a whole podcast of my own called Neil's Breakdown Stories. Um, maybe that could be a sort of a, a, a diffusion brand of this podcast. Yeah. But the best one is I am in the fortunate or frankly unfortunate position where I own a Bristol fighter. Who it's else could say of, that? How, how, how can I how can I explain it? It's, it's, About it's, twelve people could say that. Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen. No, 13. Yeah, but get it right. And it is a Savile Row meets Monty Python. <laughs> this thing, right? It's it's all of the amazingness of Britishness and all of the shitness of Brit- Britishness, <laughs> all wrapped up in a very. It photographs badly the car, a bit like myself. In real life, um, it's much more attractive. And um, anyway, so in a Bristol Fighter, it's like a trigger's broom. Anyone that owns a Bristol Fighter, you have replaced everything on this car because it was made of carbon fibre and wood. Um, They're both ultimately wood. Also, just for the people that don't know, this this was a car made early 2000s, designed in 2004-05. It's got a Viper V10 in it, hasn't it? Viper V10, yeah. Yeah. Tuned, yeah. Tuned. Um, and, and Tony, Tony Cook reckoned it was only marginally slower than a than the Starfighter. Yes, and rumored to have um, a 200, 200 mile an hour top speed. You would have to be a complete lunatic to get anywhere near that speed, with a coefficient drag of 0.29. In fact, they rumored to have made one turbo uh, that did two hundred and whatever forty miles an hour. Clearly, it was make believe. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the front wheel fell off. <laughs> driving through Watford past the Asda if anyone knows Watford you yeah. know it's a cheeky little A41 turn uh, you know you, if, if the M25 is buggered you're like I'm going to go I'm going to go through yeah. Watford past the little shell on the left yes you're heading towards Asda you know you're on your way through for your little cut through and then suddenly the car sort of jumps to the left and I'm thinking, fucking hell, that doesn't sound very good. It's obviously just been back from a full service. It's always just been back from a full service <laughs> when you break down. And then so then I sort of whack it up on the, you know, manage to get up on the grass. I get out, and I think we have I've given a little photo to the guys, so we will put a photo. Basically, the front wheel had sort of fallen off, and the whole of the front suspension had collapsed. Oh, no. Um <clears throat> and I can go into more detail on that. Anyway, it, that can you imagine how long that's going to take? I can't even remember. It was like a whole day. It's a it's a book. This story, but um, yes, front wheel fell off of a Bristol fighter in Watford. I don't think that's ever been said before. No, <laughs> <laughs> praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. This is what they call an omni shambles, isn't it? It's just perfect. Yeah, I don't. So, what was Mr. Crook still alive then, or had he gone by then? No, crooked, crooked, um, crooked, gone. Yeah, I bought my first Bristol off Crook actually in 08, just before he retired. Here's an interesting one for you, Neil. When you've got a Bristol fighter that has a wheel fall off it, 
to whom do you turn? I think that's the one thing. We, we've all got someone. We've all got a patriarch or a matriarch or someone that can help us. But who Jesus, do you go to? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's those lovely guys. I can't never remember their name, actually, but lovely guys down in Wiltshire that look after it now for me that have got all the bits and bought all the fighter bits. And I think they're building another couple of new ones. Um, and I've got I've got a brilliant local mechanic to me who sort of deals with old shit that breaks down all the time. But yeah, we did. It was, the, the front suspension collapsed, which you, you don't I need. I hate that. Him in that. You don't no. need that in Watford. <laughs> I've got one of those stories. I'm just going to decide. While I ask Edward Lovett what his is, I'm going to decide whether I can tell my story on that. On but that. I mean, thank God Neil was in Watford, not going down a motorway at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah there would be a, different a horrible thought. Yeah, Edward yeah. Lovett. Tell I, us- Tell us uh, what happened to you when you had your most complicated breakdown. Well, do you know what I um I've been very lucky. I, I've I think we're gonna do a whole episode. Neil can have a whole episode on breakdowns. I can have a whole episode on crashing cars. So I I'll keep the crashing cars things because I did break down once uh, halfway through a um halfway through a crash in Swindon <laughs> in, in a four five eight. I'm sure it was a breakdown. It was a there was a fault of some description. <laughs> but I, I've actually only ever had two breakdowns, and they're nothing really to talk about. But they're still interesting experiences when it's the first time it happens. But I had a a clutch go in a golf which I'd never felt a clutch go in a car before, so I didn't know what the fuck was going on. That was kind of weird, but now I know what it feels like for a clutch to go. And and then I had an e, um, E30 320i. These were both trade cars, so I was doing the trade running around for the Dick Lovett group and got the shit as cars to drive around in. <laughs> and then on a Friday afternoon, on a bank holiday, in a heat wave somewhere near Bath, they asked me to go and pick up this three grand's worth of E30 320i, which obviously had a hole in the radiator uh, <laughs> and, and didn't decide to work. So I sat on the side of the road for four hours waiting to be uh, picked up. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. I called daddy and said they made me drive this car. <laughs> <I was> furious. <laughs> Bloody just put the phone down on you. <laughs> exactly. Deal with it. <laughs> Edward, you do have a bit to laugh at yourself. I'll give you that. Um, no, I, I, it's fine. Like, I, I just, it's, I was, it's quite surprising. I don't have stories of breaking down. I have lots of stories of crashing. Do you know what? Yeah, I think I that just shows you that I never crash. Modern cars, mo- modern cars are incredibly reliable. You know, you just, yeah. there's a particular, I'll go through some of my experiences, but there's the modern era. They tend to just, and it's never dramatic. It's normally a black box that goes. And, it, and this is the worst thing about it. They tend to produce really bad stories. So when you have a modern car breakdown, you can't give it that my wheel fell off and my fighter. Normally the dashboard just goes, we're fucked. And you just roll to a halt. Yeah. I was on home, the A4 outside Harrods or yeah, Brompton no, Road and my Range Rover stopped working. It's not a particularly exciting story. No great, no great stories of daring do of how you flag someone down and took the axle out of the back of their fucking Celica and st- there's none of that. Right, no. Chris Cooper, you must have a better one. Well, um, the one I was going to tell, but we we probably haven't got enough time tonight, and it will take about three million years, uh, was when I was ch- a child and my parents were driving. And it was a, effectively a breakdown that started on the devil's elbow, which some people in Scotland will know. It was a very, very famous, very uphill double apex hairpin bend where my mother burnt out the clutch on the family car. It was a Vauxhall Cresta. Ooh. And it, this breakdown ended two years later <laughs> when we were driving to our very first package. It's the beast. <laughs> There he is. Sorry, for, for those who aren't watching, we're looking at dogs, uh, Chris's dog in the background. <laughs> and it ended two years later where my father then had a Daimler V8 250 Mark II Jag. Which he oh, they're for, rare cars. Well, he, oh. this is in the 70s. He bought it for about modern money, 500 quid. It had Lucas stuff on it. Anybody knows anything about old cars and Lucas, it never worked. We were going to Luton Airport for our very first ever family holiday abroad. And the thing broke down. And my where, dad's where, were you going? Where, where were you going abroad? Tunisia. Oh. And um, we, he, my father being an engineer, realised that it was the fuel pump. The fuel pump was in the boot. Um, and what it required was somebody to tap the fuel pump because the sediment got stuck. So he couldn't do both. So my mother, who was terrified and tortured by the thought of driving after being 
humiliated on the devil's elbow on the A93 in Cairngorms, very reluctantly took the wheel. All the luggage came into the car with my brother and I, and my dad got into the boot and pulled the boot lead down and just tapped away on the fuel pump while no. my mother drew through London. At some point, we got into London, and because she was a very, very terrified driver, there were some red lights in the train. It was very early in the morning. She wasn't So the red lights went to green, and she didn't move on because she was a bit nervous and so forth. Um, my dad must have thought, oh, we're here. We've oh, no. <laughs> so he lifted the boot lid just as my mother decided to drive away, which would have been fine, apart from the fact that the two policemen in the car behind no. thought that we were body snatchers. So <laughs> head after my mother and arrested my mother and questioned my father for distress. So anyway, but that's not the story I'm going to tell. The story, <laughs> I'm going to tell. the story I'm going to tell is, and you're right, and Neil, you must have had this. You and I have both had a Renault 5 GT Turbo. Lovely. What did Renault 5 GT Turbos always do? Clutch Don't cable broke. When they were hot. Clutch cable broke. Oh, okay, yeah. So know. I learned how to drive a car, because when it first happened, I thought, I've got to call the AA, until I realised I wasn't a member of the August Automobile <laughs> Association. Um, so I thought, how hard would it be to drive this car without a clutch? Turned out, because I'm a driving god, still quite difficult, Hmm. Um, so you put it in first gear, start it on the starter, yeah. and then you just balance that synchro mesh revs and so forth. And I got through, uh, my girlfriend then was living in, not facility, another one. Um, we were, she was living in Bromley. And I drove through Bromley to the house she was staying in and then back home to Kent where I was living with no clutch. I thought I was driving God. It was amazing. Did it twice. Second time, it took me a week before I bothered replacing it. I thought, how hard is it? But that doesn't happen anymore. Cars don't have clutches very much and the clutch cables don't really go. But mine, I had two clutch cables going around in a 5 GT Turbo. Ah, uh, that means it was operator. Have have one, one's never. a mechanical, two is definitely down to the operator. Probably is. Well, that, remember that E30 M3 DTM car? Yeah. That our mate Guy Spur had. So we raced that in the young timer race. I think you broke that as well, didn't you? It did. Well, the clutch cable went early in the race. Yeah. I got the fastest lap of the race without a working clutch pedal. How yeah. fucking impressive is that? And the that? amazing thing is, you never ever told any of us at the time. No, I know. I, I'm, I'm so glad I've got the opportunity <laughs> now. Anyway, I'm going to send you one of these, them. Chris. I've, I've got this just for patting myself on the back <laughs> in the office. I need there. one of those. <laughs> there was a, there was a very, very, very eminent surgeon. He was a vascular surgeon who um, um, worked for a very, or, you know, um, he used to operate in a very eminent English family. Won't tell you who they are, but about the most eminent English family. So he are was. They, on... Are they from Swindon? <laughs> yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he uh, he he was a big Bentley driver. Drive this thing. Um, he 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 loved driving it to Harley Street and to his NHS hospital. And um, his big thing was going and touring France every summer in his Bentley. He used to change the Bentley every I don't know how many years. And um, he went on one such a summer holiday, they had a great, great time there. And then on his drive back, he just wasn't happy with something that was coming from the front right wheel. It just didn't feel right. The car was pulling badly. He felt it wasn't steering correctly. And um, eventually smelt this sort of burning smell, came to a stop and uh, just refused to drive it. He managed to get um, the French, whatever the, the equivalent of the RAC are, out. Um, they really didn't know what was going on, put the car on a tow truck, stuck him on his ferry, came back to England, and he, he was literally, he was towed, met at the ferry, towed home, got up the next morning, and he called the RAC and said, right, <clears throat> you need to take this car back to wherever it was, Jack Barkley or whatever, and they said, sorry, sir, you know, you've used up your one RAC life coming from France to home, and he said, well, this is just rubbish, and uh, because of because he was literally the most connected man, he managed to get the chairman of the RAC on the phone. And he was like, look, I want this car. You know, something's wrong with this car. French haven't been able to work out what's wrong with it. You know, your RAC guys are saying they're not going to tow me. They turn up and they tow his car to the Bentley dealership. He managed to get it onto, you know, it does smell terrible. It did, just something doesn't seem right about the front right-hand corner. They, they get the thing up and basically... He'd been driving at night. He'd run over a Marseille traffic cone, <laughs> stuck in the car, and melted. 
literally as he was driving it. Oh, anyway, they pull the cone out. Car was fine. His exact cost. Zilch. I think there's there's definitely a common theme there that all of us have had situations where the trauma of the breakdown combined with the fact that you can't even begin to think it was you or that was involved in it breaking down means that when you're presented with the, the unfortunate facts, there really was either operator error or, or nothing that serious. You don't know what to do with it because you're incandescent. You're wound up. Your day's been ruined. You've been looking forward to driving this car. There's nowhere to go with it. In fact, it's, it's one of the most high pressure situations that any car person can be in yeah yes you left yeah. The, even someone mild-mannered like neil i could see murdering a grape yeah i i, I <laughs> that's why i was that day i was there with you neil i was i was getting the trailer out of the shed and i was it was an adventure and then you got saved and that was it you, you know what I, I i don't really get stressed is the truth of it i have to if you if you own so much shit as i do you have to be prepared mentally so sometimes every couple of months we sat on the side of the road for a few yeah. hours waiting for the AA. Otherwise, and, and actually the mindset you the mindset you present there, my my who I've mentioned before, my great auntie Janet, who was my favorite relative, who was born in 18, God knows what. She always just said, she said she found it amazing that the young generation always assumed they were going to complete the journey. She said it was the other way around when she was younger. She said, because my my family just before the war, were weird liberals in Bristol, and they wanted to demonstrate the fact they didn't have much money. So they, bought, they sold their car and bought a motorcycle and sidecar, and the three daughters would go in the sidecar with the nanny, and their parents, my great-grandparents, would ride this fucking thing from Bristol to Western Supermare. And she just said, we never got there. <laughs> you never did. You had a puncture on the way. She, you, she said we, the Cornwall was like going to the North Pole. Change the gasket. There was no <laughs> way you were, you didn't assume you would complete the journey. If you did, you'd all sit there afterwards and go, "Well, how did that happen?" Yeah. yeah. Whereas now it's a totally different mindset because yeah. life's so different. Right. You never I, said the same thing, by the way, about sort of the golden age of flying. That yeah. it was basically you were always late or you died. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Not that golden, is it? Not a big, no. not a bingo on a break. So th uh, this was carefully worded by by Neil, and I'm going to just reinterpret it slightly because complicated breakdowns can be sort of mechanically complicated, or the outcomes can be complicated. But they're also, if you work in my trade, they can be quite sort of professionally complicated because you're often put in situations where something breaks, you wish it hadn't broken, and the idea of telling people that it broke on reflection doesn't necessarily help either party. You don't know what to do. So if I, I'm not going to suddenly let you peek behind the curtain too much because there's been several where I've protected car companies and I don't regret doing it I think if you give me a car that's early in a pre-production phase and it doesn't work I don't there's no joy in me telling people that it doesn't work that's not that's just not journalism if you give me a car that's being sold to people and it comes from a dealership or it comes from a press fleet and it doesn't work then I'm going to tell people it doesn't work that's a different thing so I was I have to say of the modern era the AMG one experience for me at the Nürburgring last year I think it was just a, a bit over a year ago was the most extraordinary sort of hypercar supercar experience I've had in, in my working life this is Mercedes-Benz company that consistently I think has had other than Porsche the highest standards of R&D higher standards of of making sure just cars will work under any conditions it's the oldest car company in the world and it has its reputation for a reason and it delivered it gave me a car that just didn't work which I just thought was odd and it didn't work and it didn't work and they tried to make it work and i've never seen poor men with laptops look so they're just embarrassed they didn't want to be there and then they gave me another car and that broke and i just amazed amazing body language of really clever committed people just and they just thought can we just sack this off and just go and just forget this ever happened and he never drives this car but sadly when you've got you know 100 grand's worth of film crew there for the day you can't you've got to go back with a film so the AMG one was just extraordinary how complicated a breakdown that was for me. Well beyond my political skills, I just said, I don't know what to say to you boys. This isn't finished. You shouldn't, how are you going to sell these to people? If, if someone pays two and a half million quid for this, you're mugging them off. And I, I don't know what's happened, but I, you know, one's burnt down. They've got a massive road show with Lewis and George telling people how great it is. But my experience, oh, you shouldn't be selling that. Um, Mm -hmm. the the sl65 was another strange one that's a car that's gone into folklore because it was it was a very very limited edition sl of the god knows r whatever series it was r 
two, two, three, I two. Um, R two thirty. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it had a wide body. It's arguably the best looking black series ever made. A remarkable. Roof didn't body. come down, did it? No, it was a hard no. top. Anyhow, they gave me one of those, and that just kept the power steering fluid bottle kept just pissing stuff out, and I couldn't get anywhere with it. It was a nightmare, but I didn't know what to do. I just thought, it's, we got the exclusive to drive it. And if you get the exclusive to tell the story, and all you do is whinge about it breaking down. I think people don't really want that. They want some joy, don't they? they no. yeah, yeah. I noted that one down. I think my favourite one that was, I reckon, politically complicated was Autocar Magazine's best driver's car of about 2001 or two. We went to Goodwood and we had a TVR Tamora. And we might have told this to you guys anyway, but a TVR yeah. Tamora absolutely was shredding it around this fast, oversteery, short wheel base. It was, I remember it was yellow, it looked fantastic. Anyhow, being a TVR, it did, it just performed beautifully. Then it shit itself, of course it did. But it shut itself in the most spectacular way. Oil and water mix, they came out of the exhaust pipes and it was just smoke and mayhem and drama. And the two people driving the car were two very well-known test drivers from Lotus. And we published a photograph of them with their arms up like this in the blown up TVR in the magazine. And Peter Wheeler went, it's fair to say he went absolutely mad. And I think lawyers got involved and everyone got shouted at. That was a very, very complicated one. But in terms of actual breakdowns, I'm like, Neil, I've got so much old shit, I could go on and on and on. But there's one that, I, that, that was the breakdown that, here's one for you, Neil, you'll agree with me. It's, there are breakdowns that are so traumatic, they make me fear breaking down again. Those are the ones that I don't like. And I, this is one. I had an Alpina B10 V8S, which I somehow blagged when I worked at Autobahn in 2002. It was a good car. But it's a, up the power to 380. It wasn't quite as fast as an E39 M5, but no speed limiter. She would do a buck a buck 80 everywhere down the auto, auto wherever to France. I'm going down there. Girlfriend's with me. And we've got an RS4, a Swiss plated RS4 and convoy after Exxon Provence. It's your dream scenario. You just got enough firepower. You've probably got a bit more poke than him. And out of every payage, he gets away a bit. And then I, mm -hmm. I drag him back. I drag him back. And we go, he was on those flowing roads. It was glorious. Anyhow, then suddenly I'm going, oh shit, here we go. Got, something's gone wrong with the tire. Tire's deflated, but it hasn't punctured. I think we're okay here, but the sidewall's weakened. So I pull off, go to the service station, and I lean down, girlfriend's sort of in the car, sleeping, and um, and I think, I can sort this out. So I go to the, the compressor, put my euro in, might even mean before it, no, it's still euros, and I start pumping this tire up. It's just not going up properly, but it's not punctured. So I get my head down to it, I can't, I can't hear anything here. I keep pumping air in. And the next thing I know, there's a French trucker standing over me wearing like sort of clogs, they're like wooden clogs. And he was saying something along the lines of, are you okay? And I could just see up Brace his yourself. I could just see up his right short leg and I could see the oh, no. of one of his testicles. <laughs> I remember that vividly. <laughs> and anyhow, I didn't really I don't know what was going on, but I had I'm a already traumatized. I had a decent laceration down the side of my face. I couldn't hear properly. And you'll know what's happened here. I've what I'd done was I damaged the tire on the inside, I'd weakened it, and it it had ballooned, it had created a massive, yeah. like that a golf ball, and more and more blister on the inside. And I kept blowing it up until it popped, <laughs> and my head was by the wheel and it knocked me out. Um <laughs> so no, no, my, no. and I tell you what, even now, if I get a puncture, I will not go, I'll put my head anywhere near a yeah. wheel ever again. It was the most stupid thing yeah. I've had in the car, but it, it properly knocked me out. But I did get wow. to see a really good, I have to say, properly pursued French knacker. <laughs> um, I, sh I should have uh, I should have talked about the Alpina B five as well, Chris. <laughs> no, we're not anymore. B anyone but Alpinas. But yeah, I, uh, the breakdowns are never straightforward. Um, here we go. We're going to move on to the best ever car of the future or concept car. I'd rather go concept car, really. Because we've talked about stuff that we'd like to have been, but wasn't made. This is a similar area. Concept cars. Um, I'm going to go straight to manage for this one. Mm. I, when I first saw it, I wasn't absolutely sure. But then the more I looked at it, and the more I read about it, the more absolutely sure I was about this. And it's um, Mark Newson's Ford 021C, the 21st century car. Do you remember it? 
Yeah. Came out in orange. Nice. Orange. And it, yeah. it looks like Googling. Uh, literally, it's the car that a child would draw. Um, and it's 1999. And um, you know, I'm very lucky in that I know Mark a little bit. And uh, he's just, he's got the most amazing mind. I mean, literally the most amazing mind. And um, it was actually Jay Mays at um, Ford who commissioned him to do this. And it's just got so much design packed into what looks like a child's drawing. And um, I mean, it, 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 it's so beautiful. So it's got, um, what do you call those things? Suicide doors, don't you? The one where the ones that hinge. Yeah, from really hinged, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing. So the doors, ah, there you go. It looked like an Apple car. If, if Apple did a car. Yeah. Which yeah, they were. And Mark, yeah. and Mark, you know, Mark, Mark worked with um, Johnny Ives forever. And, um, you know, that's that that really what it's just mm. so, so subtle. It's got. Yes, exactly. Um, it, I mean, everything about this car is just not what it may seem. It just the curves are beautiful, a little bit more subtle. And you think the boot is the most incredible thing. The boot is a draw. It actually comes out like a drawer, just like a drawer, like drawer, drawer. It's just incredible. The lights at the front, it's just this. And this is 1999, this amazing single LED. If you look at even the, even, um, the door handles, they're little chrome door handles. And before you put your key in, there's a little Perspex ring around them that just lights up. I mean, it is the most subtle, clever thing. And I didn't know one thing about this because Mark loves that orange. And... Uh, I can't remember the motor show where it debuted, but when it went to Japan, they painted it like lime green. Yeah. So, you know, you see these two versions of this car, but it is just the most extraordinary piece of design. Even the, um, I remember the instrument panel kind of floats and it's just infinitely adjustable. I mean, and the, the seats inside all swivel. They all go around. I mean, every single bit of design. I mean, I, the other thing, I, I you should have a little look at his... Um, his chair. Now the name's just gone out of my head. It, it made him very, very famous. The chair that he designed. I'll Google it for you. Keep talking. Yeah. So that that that's what Jay Mays saw. And there's a there's a quote I found, and he said about this car because it's got such a sort of sixties retro feel to it. He the, the quote is it's probably more George Jetson than George Jensen, and mm. I thought that mm. was just such a great phrase. You know, this is a. Uh, it looks like it should just be something that's literally penned by Hanna Barbara in the sixties. Right. But actually, Capellini, Capellini chair, is that right? No, it's not the Capellini. It's got a more obvious name. It's something I not Concord. What's the goddamn name of the chair? It's it was in a Madonna video. Not it's, the ant. It's a really famous chair. We'll it's find a bit of it and the, put it up here. Yes, it's three legs. It's got three. Yeah, it's like a little. It's a tripod. Not the, not the Christine Keeler chair. No, not the Christine Keeler. It's a you. You lie back on it. I'll, I'll find oh, it. I'll okay. shout it out. The embryo lounge chair. <laughs> no, it's not three-legged chair. <laughs> but Mark Newsom. I'm loving all these chairs, though, monkey. <laughs> yeah. no, but it's a, it's just it is. I mean, it's a, as a concept car, honestly. And by the way, I, what I didn't know was that critics at the time thought it was crap. Which well, actually know. really irritates me because actually it's so far ahead of its time. Never listen it, to the critics. No. Um, uh, was I'm it a really runner? Really. Was it electric powered? Was it? It's called the Lockheed chair. That's it. Yeah, okay. I just found it. Yes, the Lockheed chair. Um, I don't know if it was a no, it's I think it's got a it's got a perfect. It's I think oh, it was nice. one Ooh, point. Look. I can like, see that and I can see you sitting on that next week, Neil, in your man cave there. Yeah, that looks like Mick Jagger's tongue made into furniture. <laughs> <laughs> made, made from an old Boeing. <laughs> I think Lockheed. it is a runner. I think it is a runner, Chris. I think okay. it's a, I can't remember the engine they put in it, but it's a runner and a, and a Pirelli made the tyres. I mean, everything about this was so scarily thought through. And that's him. You know, he was a he was um he, he started in jewellery. So he makes a sort of, you know, he's an incredible artist. Did he do really tongue studs? What? It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Edward love it. Concept cars. Are they something that interests you or not? Uh, they, they are. It's interesting. Doing the research today, it's quite amazing how much of the concept car in general makes it to production. 
um, it, where design cues, et cetera. And what, what we, we talked last week, Chris, about um, these different Porsche concept cars they've been releasing. Yeah. And they, they did a 919 Street. Oh, and yes, that 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 car is effectively going to be making it to production as because it looks exactly like the Mission E, yeah. um, in in, ter- in all the design cues, and, and they they also did a 960 Turismo, which as a saloon car, God, that is cool. But I've got, I've I've chosen I've got three other ones here. Before they did the Veyron, they did the Bent, and I'm going to butcher the name. Hopefully, someone can correct me. But they did the Bentley. Hyundai Aris. Hyundai, yeah, yeah, which is a, it's a corner at Le Mans, isn't it? That's Le Mans. Yeah. Yeah. Which was the forerunner to the to the Veyron. That was a beautiful looking design, but they probably did the right thing building it on the Bugatti. And then two cars with massive bonnets. The Cadillac 16. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Why have you ju- that was mine, Edward. That was Bonnet. mine. Oh, find another one. Fine, and I'm going to have one more, which you probably haven't chosen, and I, because it's a bit more modern. And fine, you know they're never going to make this car. This, these, this is a concept car. They're really never going to make. But when the Vision Mercedes Maybach Six that they I had that as well. Oh, new- <laughs> that was good. I just when I look, I'm looking back at those photos. It's so ostentatious, but it is so beautiful. Yeah, I agree. so beautiful. Neil Clifford, concept cars, an absolute necessity and a brilliant way of prefacing the designs of the future, given what you do for a living, or just nonsense to keep people coming to motor shows? Well, I, I, mine is from when I was a child, which is the Pinaferina Modulo. Oh, yeah. I think I, that that's, I don't know why that car stuck in my mind so much. It came out, I think, 1970. I mean, I was only three then, but probably in the mid 70s this car was doing doing the doing the rounds really as yeah. its ultimate incredibly crazy thing it was in white i'd never seen a white ferrari before pinaferina was always and still is my love in terms of car design really in fact i'm going to a pinaferina dinner on monday night Get you launch of a car yeah the um, let me actually, what's the bloody name of the thing? I don't know why I'm invited. You're going to the Batista, Batista. Yeah, you are going to the Batista. I know the guys who put that together. The Batista sure. Nino Farina edition part. Mm-hmm. invite have a plus four on it on the little bit of card. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, yes. Okay, great. Sure we can find way, I'm sure we can find a way in there, like cleaners. Yeah. Or something. Well, they did say, do I want to bring anyone? I said, I don't really know anyone interesting enough that want to come. Oh, they're the they're, they're trying to flog you one, Neil. Yeah. They're trying to flog oh, you one. No, I get all that. It's, it's five minutes from my office. Anyway, anything to do with Pinaferina, even if it was, I don't know, a, a, a party in a McDonald's, I'd go because I, I adore Pinaferina, you know. It's a shame. Does, does Jim our... Glickenhaus own the Modulo now? Who yeah, owns? Uh, yeah, yeah. Does. James Glickenhaus has, has made it fully running, got it all working. It's V12. It's got this incredible sliding canopy that comes right off. It's straight out of UFO. It's a fighter jet, isn't it? It's just yeah, it, 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 is it know, a BB underneath? It's a it's a BB. It's a BB. It? Yeah, it's a BB. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a, a Phantom F4 canopy. Nice. And, this amazingly long sort of tubular steering wheel. And yeah, he drives it around. I mean, amazing dude that has converted it to be a usable car now. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's my, it's always been my love. I adore Pinaferina and that, yeah, that's my car. I think it did get a bit hot at the Villa d'Este Concours a couple of years ago. Oh, you it? can imagine. It had Just a little me. fire. Just yes. a little one. Yeah. yeah, good for him. He could come on here and talk about his breakdowns. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He really could. I'll tell you what, he can. He's got some and, stuff. Up, and his lawsuits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, Chris Cooper. Um, this is the Jaguar question, really, isn't it? Concept cars. How many concept cars have they produced that they never produced? Um, <laughs> oh, and that's yeah. kind of been the frustration with Jaguar. We need to talk about Jaguar again. Um, they had something called, there was a, a Bertone, so Marcello Gantini, made something called the, in 1967, uh, the Piranha, which if you look at it, we might try and find a picture and put it up. Yes, yeah, it's I know. sort of an Espada. It's an Espada with a sort of rather Shush. dramatically shortened rear bit. Um, shown before, 
the one actually is my choice, the Lamborghini Marzal. Oh, which, which Lamborghini Marzal. The reason why it sticks in my mind was I must have been, I don't know, five, six, seven, and I had little matchbox cars. There was a matchbox Lamborghini Marzal. But even at that age, I was aware there was something special about it. It wasn't, you couldn't get one. I mean, no Lamborghini was available to me and my family when I was growing up, but you were available, it was something special. And it looked obviously because it was like a, it's a it, it became the Espada. That's it. Yeah, oh. exactly. It's silver and leather, silver leather. Silver leather. Oh, yeah. 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 So that that kind of 67. And I think the idea of a concept car, it's kind of the haute couture equivalent, you know, sort of high haute couture means high premier sewing, dressmaking. You know, you sort of everyone laughs at sort of the on the London Fashion Week or Paris, you sort of, these extraordinary garments which are boot laces tied together with a colander with a sewing machine you know they're not meant to be everyday wearable the point is they create debate they help provide direction they inspire they generate debate and and concept cars should do the same thing the the fact that so many of them making into production i think is fantastic and you know, richard, lamborghini, can... richard lamborghini said about that because I mean, I, I'm very much in love with that car. He um, he said that you can either spend a um, hundred thousand lira building a beautiful. Concept did. I read that. Car. I read that today. Yeah, exactly. And, and but I mean, because that car is just such a doozy, and you can imagine that yeah. really would have been on the front page of yeah. absolutely everything. Yeah. So, and the, the other one, given those, oh, uh, I, I knew it wouldn't just be one. Um. It's not really a concept car. The Phantom Coupe with the V16 engine in it that was in one of the John English films. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. cool. That's yeah. cool. And any car yeah. that sounds like Mariella Frostrup. <laughs> <laughs> I was on her honeymoon. Were you? I say I was on her honeymoon. Her in honeymoon what, was in the same capacity? hotel. Exactly. In what capacity? Uh, onlooker. Oh, Entertainment. Well, I thought you were going to say whip or wabbit. That might be half. <laughs> we might have to discuss that when we're together some other place. Okay. Uh, I, I feel a bit guilty about concept cars because I was so focused on being a hormonal road tester and wanting to skid things around. I couldn't understand why so many of my colleagues at Autocar would get so excited about concept cars and motor shows. I just didn't. I just saw motor shows as a way that just got in the way of skidding cars about, really. And now I just feel like I was a Luddite and I didn't really spot how important the concepts were, how important designers were. I wanted to talk to people that were honing differentials and giving us more power. But of course, if a car doesn't look right, no one's going to buy it. So design is everything. I know I've learned that far too late. And, the, and concept cars came to fascinate me. There, were, there was a particular genre of French concept car, particularly the Paris Motor Show. I love the gap between what was coming out in the concept area and what people were selling. And there was, it was never greater than with the French. Yeah. You'd go there and they'd have, a, they'd have a flat 16 fucking super coupe and all they'd sell you was a 206. And they just <laughs> cut it's just enormous chasm. That's a very good between. point. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's incredible what they, you yeah. know. So our vision for the future is a is something that's got thirteen hundred horsepower, will seat seven sheep on the way to the market. But what you can actually buy is a C one. <laughs> so this is the company that won nine Citroen won nine world championships with Sebastian Loeb and never sold a hot Zara. They didn't even bother. No. So I, it's bizarre to me. So that was the, that, that dichotomy always I found fascinating. But actually, mm -hmm. I started reading up about it about 10 years ago. The, the heyday of concept cars for me was probably America in the 50s when they just went mental. They were seduced by the right stuff, the space race, and they, they couldn't stop trying to make cars look like aeroplanes. And there are so many from that era, but there's one that stands out for me, which I remember reading about it at the time. I did a story, was the Ford Nucleon, which was a sort of, it was a nuclear powered car. Where they'd, <laughs> envisage, they'd envisage, you have to Google this thing, we'll put a project, the Nucleon. They, it, basically, they, it, they were one of, part of the CT strategy was to keep the passenger away from the ease of the reactor. Good safety tip. I mean, just, just, and I suppose if concept cars are about magical nonsense, then there is nothing. Oh, I love that. We're going to have to show it on screen. There's nothing oh, more. Go. There's nothing more nonsense oh, than that. God. That's this one. It's a yeah. flatbed with a reactor. It's straight yeah. out of Thunderbirds. Neil, why was that not? That was Thunderbird Seven, wasn't it? <laughs> that that is amazing. 
So the Ford, I love that. But actually, I there were two others that there's one that captivated me and the one that is my favorite, right? The one that captivated me the most actually was a company called Sparrow. S B A R R O. They were oh, they were yeah. on top trumps. There was always a sparrow. Yes, on top was. But no yeah. one knew what they did. And it's still not clear what they did. I don't think they ever sold a car. They would turn up. Yeah, they'd turn up with stuff like that. And they'd always have a massive stand at the Geneva Motor Show that I'm sure was just laundering cash for white powder they were selling. But it was just madness. And one year, in 87, they turned up with a car that was it was called the Monster G, which sounds like a poor rap artist. But the entire existence of the Monster G was predicated on the fact that it had wheels and tyres from a Boeing 747. That was the only reason it exists. They just... Mr. Sparrow thought, fuck it, I'm going to make a car with the landing gear from a 747. And he did. And I think we have to be I thankful. remember that. They were good. Remember that? The Sparrow. That is, that's the winner. That's okay, the winner. But, no, that, but sadly, it's not the I've one. Got I more back here. To the beginning. I'm going to find it. Yeah, you find me a Sparrow. There's Monster yeah. G. The Monster G is, is too young for that set. But there is a Sparrow in there, definitely. But I'll tell you, while Neil's looking, my winner is this. And it's actually probably... It's, I think it might be the father of all concept cars, because there is a point at which if the Miura was the first supercar, what the answer to the question, what was the first concept car, might be my winner, which is something called the Buick Y-Job, which is a very strange name. But it is, it's a car that, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, prefaced what American buyers would be buying in the 40s and 50s. And I think it's so beautiful and so well proportioned and also so accurately predicted. Oh, that my cars. days. That was in, that that's in the 30s. Beautiful. So that a concept car should tell you that a concept car should tell you what you might be driving in 20 years. Yeah. time, And that's the best expression of concept that I could come across. Mm. That first car, 1938. Can you imagine if you were a kid, you'd have thought, I'm going to work every day so I can buy one of those. Oh, when nice. I'm that's basically what happened to me. Yeah. I haven't I haven't had one day of sick in 39 years. We're not. But I've got a Bristol fighter. <laughs> <laughs> well, therapist told you to say that. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're gonna go for um we, I, th I think we might we're gonna we're gonna carry on plowing through. We might have to cut one of these off because we've been a little bit chatty today, chaps. So um here, here's one. This this could just be this could be to Neil actually. Cars that you want, yeah, but you're scared of the running costs. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can on this. Okay, running costs. Let me clarify. Running costs can mean the cost of fuel and servicing, but it also can mean depreciation. Okay, in this in this context, mm. Ed would love it. Well, that you you've thrown a. a, a, a um, that's a different angle on this. Isn't no, it? I, I haven't. haven't. It's the same thing. Well, they most of them scared the life out of me with depreciation. Let's okay, go well, with the original choice. Okay. Go on. Well, I I think it's probably race cars. Okay. Um, mm. and I've written DFE engine, and yeah. we said we mm. talked about the favourite things we wanted that were that were for our favourite Ford, and I put an engine, not a car. But I've never owned anything with a DFE, but. Yeah. I think I'd really struggle running one for a season, knowing that I got a twenty grand rebuild to, to deal with at the end of and the and, rest and, and and the rest at the, at the end of the year and the potential mishaps during the season. So you know whether it's a Formula One car or whatever it is, I think the the worry of having to uh, to face the rebuild costs of a DFE uh, that 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 could probably put me off. Manish, in your imaginary garage. What is it that scares you? Um, a really, really good friend of mine in um, in Abu Dhabi has uh, a very Neil-like collection of cars. I mean, they are so eclectic, his cars. You know, everything from Ferraris to... I mean, he's the kind of person... Who, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a C21... Um, a 21 C sitting in his garage. But he had a car that I loved. I just loved this car. It was a 1999 Bentley Arnage. I think it was a, the V8. And uh, I just love this car. And he, I used to see him sort of every year and around the time of the Grand Prix. And it was, of all, of all his cars, it was the one I just loved sitting in the back of it. I love this car. And he would just complain about this car so much. It just gave him 
every kind of problem you can imagine. He said, except for rust, because of course we don't get that there. He just said switches would stop working, pumps would stop working. He said door handles. So that, that and I think it did what, not that it matters quite so much in Abu Dhabi, but I think it did its combined cycle was sort of 12 miles to the gallon. And I think the depreciation on one of those Bentleys, if you bought one of those new, a year later, it really had shed a good 40% of its value. So navy blue Bentley Arnage V8 from 1999, mm -hmm. rather beautiful car, but... I think, yeah. I think Manish has inadvertently hit the nail on the absolute worst offender's head there. Neil Clifford. There's only two that I'm scared of, and I'll maybe just talk about one because I'm sure one of you have got the other one. A, a 959. I mean even a lunatic like me is scared of a 959 because not only is the rear panel, I think 47,000 pounds, if you sort of reversed it into a little post, but the, a lot of the parts are unavailable. Yeah. So you, you have to go and get one made by some German. If the suspension, you know, that hydraulic suspension, the buttons aren't even made anymore. The windscreen's probably like £19,000. Every single thing on a 959, you're going to be financially fucked. You've got to have so much money that you do not care yeah. if you're in a 959. Yeah. Okay, that's a very good one. I've just You, you just made me realise I need to change my choice here because I have one written down. And I've got was, another one. <laughs> which was um, it's actually one of your cars, Neil, which is the four cam engine in the 356 scares the shit yeah. out of me. Because yeah. I just, everyone says there's only three people can make them and that they are a nightmare and what mm. happened. But actually when they're running, they're joyous. And yeah. maybe stories of them being quarter of a million quid to repair are bullshit. Is that the case or not? I, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'll tell you, but I'll tell you what mine is. It's actually something that came to my attention recently. I've got been probably. I've got to be discreet. I don't know. There's one car that's not that old that's out of warranty that you'd expect never to go wrong. But I know of one that's gone wrong, and, and some of the parts prices that have come back on it are interesting. Yeah. The uh, the Lexus LFA. Yeah. Ooh, car that you would not expect to go wrong, but I know oh. there's one that's there's there's a couple I think that have gone pop, but there's one that's gone pop. Lexus OEM parts, oil pump. Guess how much? Seven and a half grand. Eighty-five thousand oh. pounds. What? <laughs> what did you say? Eighty-five you grand. <laughs> For an oil. Oh, that's why. That's why it's all very well going. It's out of warranty. It doesn't matter. We'll just, we'll just try. You know, you could you could end up with a. You know, it, some of these cars are very very specialist, aren't they? Particularly, and this is why turbochargers are helpful because they keep RPMs down. But rule of thumb, anything that revs is fecking expensive. Mm. Uh, and it, it don't even get me onto racing cars. A friend of mine is, is, you know, is lucky enough to own a Ferrari Formula One car, uses it quite a lot. And some of them, you know, eventually you come up on kilometers. You just you use yeah. the life of the engine. I think a sort of 0708 engine refresh is about 300,000 euros. Yeah. An F1 car, that's a sort of refresh. That's um, not a rebuild. No, I mean, the other, the other equivalent of that, obviously, is a Carrera GT, and there's big drama in that at the moment. You can't drive them, right? No. There's, a, there's a problem with that car with the wishbone suspension, isn't there? What, have, yeah. they, have they sort of advised people to stop driving them until you have a recall? Or Yes. Is what? it a recall or is it a paid Porsche. Porsche. Is it a paid? It's a recall, yeah. and it's also a recoil, I would have thought, if you're looking at your bank account. Yeah. Now, Chris Cooper. Well, it kind of... It, it, you, you quite quickly get into this is like aviation territory. Um, there was a big, the, some of you might have seen a few weeks ago, there was a, it was the UK Armed Services, Armed Forces Day. It's an annual national celebration. And this year it was down in Cornwall, where I happened to be at the time. And there's fantastic airspace. So there were red arrows are there. Um, there was a typhoon display, which is unbelievable. They were no, supposed no. to have the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, which is a Lancaster Hurricane and Spitfire, all powered by a Merlin engine, which is, must be 70 years old. And you'd think by now people would have worked out the Merlin engine. But on the day before the display, um, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, the Coningsby or somewhere in Lincolnshire, wherever they're based, they discovered a problem with one engine in one of the aircraft. So there's six engines in total across the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, three aircraft. And they, they grounded all of the Merlin-based everything. This is 70 years old. 
and they probably found something they haven't seen before and it was so serious so it's like aviation a few years ago when the RAF were flying all of the old British Airways VC-10s they had 23 VC-10s and at any one time about one of them was airworthy because the latest thing that just must have been late 90s the manufacturer was making the tires for the undercarriage had gone bust nobody had bought the rights to it so they'd run out of tires oh, why well, is the bc10 notable chris what record does it hold bc10 yeah uh is it got the fastest it's the fastest flying subsonic airliner fastest subsonic crossing of the atlantic that's the one yeah nice it's a great plane the vc10 it was yeah. designed oh. for it was designed for hot and high operations in other words, high altitude air uh, runways where the air thinner, you've got to have a bit more grunt and or hot environments where the air's a bit thinner, you need a bit more grunt. Well, I had those four. It was original, the Rolls-Royce Conway was the original bypass. It was called a bypass engine where more of the thrust was the fan forcing air down the outside of the yeah. combustion chambers in the turbine. So like the the modern, so the Rolls-Royce, they've just announced it, the Ultrafan, which is the successor to the Trent engine, which is what powers 380s and 787s. The Ultrafan will have a bypass ratio, I think of, somebody will correct me, in, I hope somebody from Rolls-Royce is reading, watches what we do and will correct us. I think it's like 20 to 1, so 20 times as much air goes effectively outside the combustion because it's more efficient, it's less emissions, and it's quieter. Now, so Chris, just one thing, because a very interesting point here. This is a lovely digression, but what the fuck has it got to do with which, car, with which car you're scared of owning? I have to just ask, on behalf of my colleagues here... Maybe it's a VC-10. You have down a Cooper Worm. I did have VC-10. <laughs> I did have VC-10. <laughs> which car? But, but I did have VC-10. But I also had... <laughs> I also had, because it's a bit more practical. A lot of people <laughs> attempted by this. I have been. W140 Mercedes 600. Yeah. Oh. 1991. Oh, it's a good car. Double one forty mo. I've got I've got an American friend who's got one of those who used to be on a sitcom, and he he has a hard time with it. It just you just know the switches. Any one tiny little component go, and the car is scrapped. But I'd love that. I remember my brother Mike, and you know um, Mike. Uh, he was working at the he's a photographer, working for at a gig with Castrol's in-house magazine. And we had an SL500 and a 600 SEL for a day from Milton Keynes around the uh, Cotswolds and Silverstone and so forth. And we drove around Buckinghamshire, basically pointing, saying, oh, look, poor people. And the 600 SEL, 408 horsepower, we got we got skiddy in a 600 SEL around Stowe School. It's, not, it's a Zonda oh. engine. You know, that's, what the, that's what became it's the Zonda wonderful. engine. But I think... God, you'd die thinking about what the repair bills would be. The electric I'd love one of those. that era as well. They made they made the, the sugar in the in the in the wiring loom wiring. Yeah, Therefore, mice. They just find those cars at five hundred miles away and eat all the yeah. wire. Because also they made biodegradable wiring looms for two years. What yeah. as a concept? What's that all about? That is a chocolate fire guard, literally yeah. a chocolate fire guard. That was that was one of the consequences of that ill-fated Chrysler. Finley just finished his degree, and one of the projects he did was look at the worst mergers and acquisitions. And he looked at Daimler Chrysler. Betcher. And it was really, really interesting culturally, behaviorally, how much Daimler was affected by thinking they wanted something. These Chrysler, and it was, I mean, just. Just yeah. the whole thing was written off and eventually they split. But yeah, that was mm, that time. Mm, mm. Right, so I think we've covered that one. Uh, next uh, small topic. Um, what's the what is uh, what's the best built car you've ever sat in or driven? We're right up nerd alley here, but I quite like it. It's a comfortable place for me. It's a postcode I'm well acquainted with, as <laughs> is Bill Clifford. This is a brilliant one. I, I as always, I buy a car for my wife that she doesn't know about. And we went to the Suzuki dealership in Leighton Buzzard, a guy called Anthony Betts that's yes. had dealership forever. Yeah. And I had my name on. So I was, I was almost first in the UK with the new Jimny. And, you know, there was a, like a crazy thing for those Jimnys, wasn't there? You, you actually didn't know what colour you were going to get. Yeah, it didn't matter. You just turned up and it said, it's black. I'm like, oh, great. That's fine. 
Is it there? Yes. So we went and picked up this new chimney and Anthony Betts, who's a brilliant old school, runs a fantastic operation there, said, oh, you know, here's your car and showed us around. And he said, well, it was lovely to meet you. I will never see you again. And I'm like, what? He said, this car will never, ever go wrong. You will never have to come back to this dealership ever because let me just explain. This door handle is from a 1987 Suzuki that has been tested four billion times. And this switch here on the dashboard, all these switches that are all exactly the same are from a 1991 Suzuki. They will never break. You will never ever have a problem with this car. So it was lovely to meet you. Thanks very much and enjoy your Suzuki. Have a good life. I thought that was just <laughs> fucking fantastic, wasn't it? And it's true, it never ever went wrong. Uh, <laughs> can't fault that. Uh, Everybody love it, quality. There's, there's, there's too many. I, I, I've written down here BMW and E30 and E36. Uh, I don't think I ever sat in a bad one. You know, they are, <laughs> you know, e everything. It was built beautifully. The door yeah. shut beautifully. All the switches, it, it, just everything felt right. And it, it, they never, ever disappointed you. And that didn't matter whether you're in a E, e oh, sorry, a, a 316 or an E30 M3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. They were just built perfectly. So that's my answer. I'm going to keep it short and simple. See, part like of that Mr. Clifford. is relativity, isn't it? It was how did things feel at the time? Because There you go. You've made my point before I was going to make it again, you annoying bastard. <laughs> all right. I'm here to help. I'm here, I'm here all evening. So the answer, my answer question is the same one I gave for the last one. It was the W140 Mercedes 600. So I drove to that photo shoot with my brother, very excited, because I had my Mark I Toyota MR2 company car at the time, which I thought I was pretty clever and impressive to have. And I got into 600 SEL and I thought, this isn't remotely or anything like what I thought a car could be. And I, when I drove at the end of the day back into London in this now very disappointing MR2 Mark I, mm. I thought, I didn't know cars could be like that. And I, mm. that feeling of shock and awe and extraordinary feeling of quality. I mean, that was the car that had, it didn't have parking sensors. It had two little telescopic oh, things yes. that came up from the rear quarters, which actually worked really well. They worked really, really we, well. We bought one and turned it into a red pig for a Top Gear film a few years ago. Yes, you oh, did. Yeah. They, they still worked. Brilliant. Brilliant. So just that sense of just bank vault. I mean, it, it was, but it was the relativity. It was the, it had no relation to anything. Can I be a bit arch and ask you one thing, though? And that is that if you'd arrived in an, E32 750i fully spec'd up, would the Merc have felt as special? Because those are built like tanks as well, those things. You're probably right. You're probably right. But I didn't, being a 20 something young puck consultant working a million hours a, a week at Deloitte's or wherever I was at the time, um, I didn't have access to that. So, but that in terms of memory, yeah. And nothing ever surpassed that. No, managed quality. No, I, that was so eloquent. And I think that's exactly the point. It's the car that you get into that absolutely shocks you and you can never forget it. And it was a Maybach 62 for me. I'd never oh. been in something like that in my life. And I don't think I ever will. It just, um, it was totally random. But somebody that I, I knew um, at the German embassy and we had lunch said, do you want to ride home? I said, yeah, sure. And this thing just turned up. And the door went when I closed it and I sat in this and I looked at the roof and I just looked. I mean, it was just beautiful. It must have been brand new at the time. It was yeah, 20 years ago, something like that. Never been anything like that. Never. The Maybach. That didn't work well for them, did it? Um, no, I know they didn't make any money and I <laughs> didn't sell any. No, it's interesting yeah. that, that you know, Mercedes had those two gaps. They took you no know, Smart and Maybach. Didn't work for them, bottom and top of the market. And that looking back, I don't understand why, because they did a pretty fucking good job with both of them, but they just yeah. didn't work. Um, yeah. So um, I, I love, this is where my nerdism, I, I don't often share it, but I love stuff that's built right. And I love stuff that's been tested 
to to the point where you wouldn't even believe what's gone into trying to break something. I just that that's the side of engineering that I I love, and I like knowing that's underneath my ass when I'm going very fast because it makes me feel reassured. I also think that quite often cars or a particular model of car will better display its quality if it's not got too much equipment on it. So back in the day, you'd the best way to really see how well built a Mercedes was wasn't to get into the 560 SEL, get into a 300 SE with cloth and feel the way that the manual, all the manual stuff works. Yeah. And fewer buttons, you can really celebrate the ones that are in front of you. And so I remember being taken to school one day in a Jaguar XJ6, pre-XJ40, right? Proper Arthur Daly spec. Great car, went like shit off a fan, sounded fantastic, but it was like having a family of mice in there. Everything squeaked, nothing quite worked. It was terrible. And the same person collected their new car and brought us home that day. And it was a W124 260E. This was 1989. Yeah. It had cloth seats. So he obviously chopped it in. He's been absolutely rinsed by the dealer. And he's he's had to he's basically had to trade down from a bells and whistles Jaguar to an absolute poverty spec Mercedes, which is something so many people must have done because Mercs in those days were so expensive. I couldn't believe how well built this thing was. I yeah, can remember yeah. asking if I could just stay and play with the buttons afterwards and everything you just tell there was some german that had gone right i'm yeah. in charge of heater controls yeah. and i'm going to sit here and make sure that the detents on these when you go one two three or when you roll the rotaries they're going to be like a swiss watch and you i remember just marveling oh pulling that door handle and shutting it and going it had the thing where the, the door frame rolled over onto the roof it was yeah. that's yeah. It. and then at, before i left he went it's dry because i'll show you the windscreen wiper I, I, I nearly shit the bed when I saw the windscreen wipe. The single one, the single I mean, just, it was just the like, and I suppose for me, it was that I went to school in the in the one that was charismatic and won all the car magazine group tests because of the way it drove. And I came home in the one that you'd actually want to buy. Yeah. And I, it, was, it was just, it was a stunning display of engineering. And I think what's happened amazingly is that everyone's, the Germans inadvertently taught the rest of the world how to make cars. And yeah. now they're really going to suffer for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me. Um, Facilities' dad had uh, a one, two, three, two thirty estate. A oh, great car in the mid eighties. And my father had Granadas and Rovers, which I thought were really cool. They were quite fast and they looked quite good. And this two, I thought, cracky, this is going to be dogs. It's got like it's got like no horsepower. It's got cloth seats and it's a bit dowdy, steel hubcaps. I remember getting taken somewhere by Facilities' mum and dad and Facility. And he was always very disappointed in me. The clinic? Uh, yeah. And I think he got his Mercedes. So that's actually, that's my other memory of, I didn't realise cars could be like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Facility. <laughs> okay, we're now moving on to our two-car garage, this week set by Neil of the Clifford. Therefore, I apologise if it's about 37 pages long. Here we go. <laughs> Because he likes to be, he likes to get these things accurate, don't you, Neil? I do. Early in the morning. It's finally your favourite time of year, as you have your two most exciting automotive events coming up in the next few months. Way hey, the Goodwood Festival of Speed, Festival of Tweed, and the Revival. After thirty years of hard work, your dream is to be proud of your car knowledge, and more importantly, you need to impress your fellow addicts in the car park. You have a budget of seventy-five thousand pounds. You and your wife need to be able to drive with pleasure, an odd phrase, and safely from your home in Norwich. Norwich. You, Norwich. You only need two seats. But as always, this is consistent. You need at least one cabriolet, could be a convertible as well. And don't forget your revival car needs to be pre-66 to ensure access to the best car park. Although you can sneak into those car parks if you haven't gone pre-66, as Neil is often annoyed by. Yes. OK, uh, Neil, it's your question. You can answer it first. Right, OK. So Goodwood, my favourite time of year, um, between now and September. Uh, uh, Goodwood, it's tea, it's Victoria Sponge, it's Spitfires, <laughs> it's Lancasters, it's Land Rover Defenders, it's Daffodils. So you, you've got to be British. You cannot turn up at Goodwood in a four-wheeled ME109 or a Stuka, right? So you've got to be British. Yeah, that wouldn't well, go not, down. Not, not, not necessarily right for you, Neil. No, but this is my this is my lens on Goodwood. 
So, so okay. I'm and just he, scrubbing he, out my auto union. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he lives in Norwich. It's quite a long way. And you're, you're traveling with your wife and you want reliability. You want talk. You want nice motorway um, cruising. You don't want a four cylinder little gutless thing. That's all going to be a nightmare. So you want a big engine. So I'm doing two things. I'm going for my more modern car for the Festival of Speed. I'm buying the best Morgan Plus 8. Because this thing will last forever. I can do tours with my wife. We can go to Scotland. We can go to Devon. We can go to Paris. We can drive down to, you know, the Black Forest. This is a car that is very reliable. Parts are very cheap. It's a nice V8 engine. You can buy the best one, even up to 40 grand chrome bumpers not the sort of i still like the the what the aero 8 that came after but those silly headlamps and all that i'm buying the classic shape but the last of i think 19 by well, guts 2002 i think actually so that's my first car then 65 i've really thought hard on this the first rolls royce silver shadow came out can you believe it in 1965 i thought it was yeah no, 1965. I'm yeah, not beautiful with those slim chrome bumpers. Yeah, gorgeous. The very early car with the Chippendale wood and all that lovely veneer. You've got Connolly leather. You've got four disc brakes. You've got hydromatic suspension. You've got aluminium. You've got actually the most modern car that will sit in the Goodwood Fessler Speed pre 66 car park is the Silver Shadow. And you'd get it super subtle in silver with a green leather. And it's, you know, you buy your best one, it'd be 25 grand. And it will be fucking fantastic. The air conditioning will work. It's quiet. You can cruise on the motorway. You've got two lovely cars there that are going to do everything for you in that wonderful period of Goodwood. So beautifully expressed and yet so wrong. Chris Cooper. So, um, so t- I, I made a bit of a mistake when I first read this. Well, actually, two things struck me when I read this. Ooh. I love the Norwich. You always do this because you're not going to answer the question. I am going to ask the question. That's your clever way of doing so it. So, I'm the Norwich thing really captured my mind, and maybe because I'm just a bit sort of rubbish and shit at things. But whenever I hear Norwich, I was thinking, you know, when we were growing up, there was when you used to write cards to your loved one, you'd occasionally write Swalk. On it. Remember that swap yeah. with, with a loving kiss. Yeah. With a loving so, kiss. so whenever I see Norwich, I always think about what that really meant when you wrote that on a card. But I'm too much of a gentleman to recount. Am I the only one? No, no you're, you're on your own there. But I'll work out what the acronym Norwich, Norwich means now. Norwich. Whilst you tell us what tell us what 19 cars you're going to buy with 75 grand. Nick is off ready when I come home. <laughs> Norwich. <laughs> Just me. Just me. <laughs> um, anyway. So, Ford Galaxy. Oh Ford Galaxy, go on. Ford Galaxy, 1963 Ford Galaxy. <laughs> uh, I reckon you could get, a, I found one for about 15,000. Get it right-hand drive conversion, sort the engine. Um, and I discussed this, with, and, and Cam said to me, this would be a very nice way to go down the A11 from Norwich. I, mm-hmm. thought, I love that expression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. and... That's not British, but this is British. TR6. Oh, you love TR6. a TR6. He does. He's just trying to keep value so he's got one of the shit next to him. TR6. Um, and the boy sent me a link to somebody who does triple Weber conversions of a TR6 engine. 220 horsepower, 7,000 revs. In that chassis, you're rather you than me, son. Yeah, no, straight line. Um, but the first time I read it, I thought it was 7.5 million, not 75K. It's my dyslexia. I usually get that thing the way around. So for seven and a half million, I'd have a G- original GT40 and a late 80s 6.3 V8 Vantage Volante printer well spec. Nice. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Again, totally baffling. Um, can you somehow give us a bit more sanity? Edward Lovett, never thought I'd say that. <laughs> no, I can't. And I'm taking a bit of spirit from the school pickup and making people smile. I think I am anyway. The only thing I haven't adhered to is I don't think I'm going to make my wife smile if we're coming from Nor- Norwich, unless Norwich meant um, home. What's it? What was it again, Chris? I can't say it again. I'm too mad. <laughs> Nick is off ready when I get home. When I come home. That's so, Norwich. Jesus. <laughs> my, uh, my convertible 
is a 1932 Ford Roadster hot rod. Oh, nice. Oh, lovely. Um, yeah. Something with all the right details, yeah. small, petite. I, I'm maybe thinking about having flames down the side just to, uh, you know, just to bring a bit more joy to the car park, let it stand out. I think it doesn't need it. Yeah. I think easy it's top key, you need an easy yeah. top key ring and nothing else, boss. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I would have escaped the... Uh, the ring road in Norwich without my wife getting out and taking an Uber home and me doing the rest of the journey by myself. Sometimes, can be, sometimes can be deliberate though, Edward. Yes, yeah. it can, yeah. And keeping to the American theme and smiles on the face, I think I need a Lincoln Continental Mark oh. V. Oh, that's a good car. Yeah, good and car. it's probably going to be black with yeah. uh, red pinstripes down the side. And of course, it's going to have burgundy velour. Good car. Yeah, that's a very good car. car. Love that. That's a big um, lump, that is. That's a big old lump, that is. Yeah, that but I, I think, I th well, it's going to take up, obviously, two parking spaces in the 66 car park, which I've sneaked into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to park right next to Neil. <laughs> you, you, given it's a bottom sponsored event, will you be wearing a collecting cars T-shirt? Oh, I, I've obviously got quite a lot of money saved over from my two, two cars, so I'm going to fill both of them up with collecting cars water and I'm going to give them out to people as they leave the event. Uh, Manish, what are you going for? 75 oh. grand, two cars, one's got to be pre-66, and one's got to be convertible. Or they could both be. So, so, so as you know, I like a little bit of Italian exotica. And um, I think Festival of Speed, I did find one. A black Alfa Romeo Montreal. It's absolutely Good. beautiful. That's 75 yeah. grand on its own, isn't it? Well, it's not. So the cheapest one 50. I found is 55,000 euros. Yep. Yep. But Good. actually, it was a very nice black one for about 60,000 pounds. And it had a lot of work done. What I had no idea was apparently they've got really particularly crappy water pumps. Yeah. And uh, so you have to get this sorted out. So that would be my... Um, that would be, you, can, you can see that. Just a very lightweight Armani jacket, good jeans. Yeah. A pair of, um, you know, proper... Proper suede shoes, some nice loafers. I think that'd be rather nice. And um, this next one's a bit of a bone rattler, but I've actually been in one and I found one. It's beautiful. It only costs 15,000 pounds and I would drive it from Norwich and I think it would just about make it. And it's just got more character per square inch than anything else. And it was a Morris Minor convertible. Oh, oh, I found a time. gorgeous one. It was yeah. black. It had kind of slightly knackered red leather, had a red gorgeous red canvas roof and that would be my uh that's, that's a really cool that's a good choice though 1957 15 000 pounds 68 000 miles on it yeah i know my kidneys would be very very slightly bigger having driven from norwich but i mean i think great car i think it would be quite soft i mean within limits i think it would be okay i think that's a winner yeah oh, mo moggy rags are beautiful things they, they are lovely they're a good car i, I mean beautiful for long car. journeys it'd be slow yeah. They tend to get there. Right. So well, I've read this slightly get differently. Up a week before. early, lots of stops. So for me, uh, revival is old car. You, you dust down your old car for revival. Um, but Foz, I don't. I, I think Festival Speed brings with it much, much bigger queues. And I've been stuck in one of those queues in an old car that shit itself once and never again. So I'm going modern. I'm full modern for Foz. I don't think you, it's not about turning up and trying to make a, a display of understanding old stuff. And the best modern car i've driven just about well the most complete enjoyable modern car i've driven just about falls used into this category and it's the current well just last mercedes s63 convertible oh, it's an incredible nice. motor mm. car it really, i mean they're they're 150 pounds new they're about 55 60 grand 55 in the trade now maybe a bit less and they are everything 5.5 yeah. meter twin turbo v8 Built like a proper Mercedes-Benz, baseball glove leather interior, Burmester hi-fi, everything. You go to Foz in that, people are going to look at you, think you're great, but also you've got the roof up and down when you want it. You've got the convenience of a modern car. You've got air-conditioned seats, heated seats. Your wife's going to love you. But it, it leaves me with skinny budget for the revival, but I'm confident because I love these things, and this would get to Norwich and back. It doesn't fit any of Neil's criteria. It's a small engine. We don't talk about them. They're great value. And they're full of they're full of character. They're fun to drive, and they're also they they they're historically 
worthwhile. You know, they're worth celebrating. And that's the Citroen Traction Avant. We don't talk about them enough, Ooh, but it's yeah. the first unitary body front wheel drive car ever made. They look, I just love the fact they look like, they actually look like an animal that's got all of its yeah. power and weight up front. They look front driven. And the, the rear wheels are like, well, we're along for the ride, but we're doing fuck all yeah. here. And I, and I really, really love, I just think they look so dignified. How much are they? 20, 25 grand really? for a good. Yeah, they're nothing. If you want a really early, like a 7A, an early one, they're a little bit more. Convertibles are a lot quite more. quite tempting. But they are so, and they're just, what a great value way to turn up at Goodwood. It's yeah. not British, but I think they're stunning. And I, I was going to go for a 2CV, but I've tried to drive from Bristol to Goodwood in my 2CV and gave up. Yeah. So I don't think I could do that, really. That's a good choice, that. I think there were some excellent choices there. I might have been a bit left field, but for me, Foz... Oh, I love that. Foz is a modern car. Foz yeah, is modern, is I agree with yeah, that. I, can't, I just can't be doing with the cues. Or it's a motorcycle, actually. I, we'll all be there next week, maybe. We'll but, see you all on Friday. Well, yeah. we'll see what happens. But I think um, uh, we'll now do some music. So, um, Edward, are you feeling musical this week or have you ducked out? No, I've got music. Got a couple this week. OK, well, you're only supposed to have one. Yeah, I realise that, but I've got two. Um... The first one's a real hero by College from the movie Drive, Ooh. which has got Ryan Gosling in. Yeah. I like that movie. It's a good movie. Don't uh, know that piece of music. And a nice... Say that again? I said, don't know that piece of music. It's a great movie. No, it's, a, it's a good good song. And uh, the other one, because I was Googling things that's with about driving, um, and the other one is Drive by Clean Bandit. And I listened to that and I thought, this is a cool song. I'm going to listen yeah, to this on the way home. That is a good song. There we go. There's my two. Uh, Manish. I could just imagine listening to this as I drive into Goodwood, and it would be, it's Snow Frolic, written by Francis Lai, and it's from the film Love Story, and it's just the loveliest bit of the story. Ali McGraw and... Um, Ryan O'Neill. Ryan O'Neill are desperately in love. It's snowing in Harvard or in Boston, and what they do is they kind of throw snow at each other. They make a snowman. They fall into the snow and make snow angels and they kiss. And it's just such a gorgeous piece of music. Did he write so Norwich cool. in the snow for her as well? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Unbelievable, Cooper. Um, uh, Neil Clifford, where are we? Are we still Britpop 90s? Where are yeah, we? Yeah, we are. You know, Manish put a lot of pressure on me now with this sort of representing the 90s sort of thing so i've gone straight in at the top peak 90s best uk band frankly forever apart from say the beatles or the stones radiohead i think they're just fantastic oh you've got me got to I've, reach done a, now. I've done a track before okay computer is the best album every single song is fantastic but i'll read you a little lyric i wish they'd just swoop down in a country lane late at night whilst i'm driving take me on board in their beautiful ship showing me the world as i'd love to see it i'd tell my friends they'd think that they'd, they'd never believe me they think i'd finally lost it completely it's a song called Subterranean Homesick. It's fucking amazing. Amazing piece of music. Stick that on at night, open your sunroof, get your windows down, don't break down and enjoy that. <laughs> right, so I've gone Radiohead as well, but I didn't know Neil was. Now at this point, I'd normally hurry, I would hurriedly adjust, but I'm a bit funny with Radiohead. No, no, OK, Com OK Computer and the Benz are the best known albums, but they're not my favourite album. I think In Rainbows is is just oh. absolutely sensational. And as I was watching with one of my little ones, that they're on YouTube, there's a load of studio sessions where they played all of this stuff live at the time and recorded it, and it's stunning. And there's a there's one tune surely on In Rainbows that is just so it's just knockout. It's called Weird Fishes. Yeah. Um, and if you, it's just well put it this way: don't play it if you're in a vaguely emotional state because you're oh, probably in tears. It's it's a stunning song. It just soars and soars away from you, and it takes you on, the, takes you to places that your your brain doesn't quite realise they could go to. My it's, wife it's will a be really good off. driving tune as well. Oh, my, wife will, my wife will be pissed off that you've chosen that because it's her favourite Radiohead song. It probably is their best song, but they're all good. <laughs> it, it's brilliant that song. Uh, so yeah, I was a bit gutted that he went Radiohead, but, but the one thing I have to say is there's a new Queen's the Stone Age album out last week. Uh, called uh, In Times New Roman, I think it's called. It's a, and it's, that's got some banging tracks on it, so go and listen to that. Um, I think, uh, who else have I? I've not spoken to Mr. Cooper yet, have I? Come on. No. 
So um, hey, I was thinking about ni- I was thinking about nineties today. I was on a train going into London today, and uh, going from Hemel in towards Houston, and the conductor, I kid you not, was the, his voice was the spitting image of the Phil Daniels voiceover at Star Park Life. <laughs> I, I almost went down the carriage to say, it's got to be Phil Daniels. And I'll say to him, has anyone ever pointed out to you that your voice is the... And I didn't do that. It was a bit short time. But I didn't pick Park Life because two weeks ago, I had a song two weeks ago when we didn't do music. And I was that day I was in a building, a meeting room I'd, I'd hired for, to do this when I was in town that's run by the landmark office, rented office building. And it reminded me of a shop, a clothes shop that used to exist in Marlowe called landmark and i'm a bit like monkey close the things that cover my body and when i've done that job that's it and my wife lynn got really really fed up <laughs> so she, we found this shop in marlow landmark it was brilliant it was a really nice and they would just say you need some of this and some of that and you could just say you could come out with things which weren't just covering your body it was lovely i fortunately went bust a couple of years ago because everyone's buying stuff on the internet but i was in there one night after work picking some stuff up and there was kind of some US rock stuff. And the, the one of the ladies who worked there, I said, what's that? And she said, it's Poodle Rock. I said, what's Poodle Rock? I said, think about it. It's like all those big permed hairdos. And the song that was playing, which I really love, by Asia, isn't that a fantastic? But the album covers were like big totemic serpents and waves and volcanoes and the A of Asia with like a serpent and it was all over. Heat of the moment. Like 1980. Oh, that's a good three. song. Yeah. Heat of the Moment by Asia. That is a banging tune. Poodle. Poodle that's Rock. That's my well favorite. Um, okay. So, uh, Edward, you've chosen, everyone's had their music. We've all done our two car garage. I think that just about brings to an end this meeting of the Collecting Addicts. I've got one small thing to say. And uh, so, this is episode 25, obviously. Uh, episode 26 will be going live next Friday, the 14th. But on the 14th, we are going to have a very small and intimate live podcast recording about 30 minutes from Goodwood. We are going to be very limited on numbers. If you are interested in attending, go on to collectingcars.com, on to events, and please apply. Um, but also, please don't get angry if we can't accommodate you, because we are very limited on numbers. We will do, do something in September for unlimited numbers as well. Um, probably up at Bista, so all will be welcome there. Um, but for those that can come next Friday the 14th, we look forward to entertaining you and meeting you then. Big news. We'll make, sure Chris Cooper's, we'll make sure Chris Cooper's being on the Lady Petrol so we can <laughs> get plenty of vernacular in there. Um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us, and we will uh, we'll waste some more of your time next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>